it's great to be back in town. Uh, it's been a while. Um, and thanks, yeah, I wanted to say thanks to the seminar committee. So uh, Will as well and Rafa, who's not around, wonderful, great, fantastic uh, committee, who's giving me this opportunity to give a bit of an, an update on some of the research that we're doing at the Top End Hydro Lab. Um, so if some of you do not know what the Top End Hydro Lab is, I invite you to uh, look at the real website. We have a, a web page so you can learn a little bit about what we're doing um, in the lab. Um, so before I start, all the work that I'll be presenting today is very much a collaborative effort. And um, so a big shout out to all the friends, colleagues, contributors to this. Um, so over the past three years or so, we've um, built this team of um, scientists, mostly young scientists, um, with uh, people from across the world. I think we are 30 in total, and we've got 16 nationalities represented. Um, and um, yeah, one thing that I'm pretty happy about is that we managed to reach a gender balance in this team. So it's, it's pretty cool, I think. Um, so some of you will recognize some familiar faces from CDU. So here we have Francesco Ulloa, uh, Adam Rexroad, and Vanessa Solano, who's just left us. Um, so thanks to these people as well for contributing to this work. All right. so. I'll just um, start with a bit of background on the global carbon cycle. Most of you will be familiar with this, but um, I, I guess a simple way of putting this is that there's pretty much a continuous um, movement or exchange of carbon uh, between different pools at the global scale. So we have the first the atmospheric pool, then we have the ocean pool here. Then we have what on this diagram is called the vegetation and land pool. So this is pretty much the terrestrial ecosystems. And of course, we're adding to this the fossil fuel emissions. And um, the good news here is that some of the CO2 that we are emitting through fossil fuel burning is actually taken up by vegetation. Not all of it will be staying in the atmosphere. And this is done through photosynthesis. And it's important because if you look at this diagram here, the two fluxes, the one coming into the terrestrial ecosystem pool and the one coming out of it, there's a net, a positive net difference, right? You see there's six units here. It doesn't really matter what the units are, but what's important is that we are actually increasing this storage of carbon, as Lindsay knows. Um, and um, this is what we call the terrestrial sink or the land sink. We are um, yeah, storing more and more carbon in this sink. And this sink has actually been increasing over the past decades uh, as we've been adding more CO2 into the atmosphere. This is pretty much um, a fertilization effect. So we're fertilizing vegetation with our CO2 emissions. Um, so that's kind of the good news part of the story. Um, yeah, this, this illustration is just to give you an idea of how massive these terrestrial stores can be, including in some of the ecosystems that we have up here in the top end, so the wetlands, tropical savannas. And so every year there will be more of this carbon through the terrestrial sink that enters this massive store. Again, I said that's the good news side of the story. <laughs> now the bad news is um, that's not all the carbon that is fixed by vegetation actually stays in this store. Some of it will be leaking out of the store. And there's several, um, I guess, two major um, leak or loss pathways that people, this one people generally think about it quite easily, especially up here, fire. Fire is indeed a loss of terrestrial carbon. It's um, kind of unavoidable, although you can reduce this, this uh, flux. Uh, and that's pretty much what is being done up here uh, in, the, in Northern Australia with you know, one of the best fire management uh, programs in the world where we are doing justice, trying to reduce what we lose through fire by doing early rising and fires. So that's the kind of um, obvious uh, loss of terrestrial carbon, but there's another pathway that is not necessarily so, um, that people don't necessarily think about. And this one is related to inland waters. So what I call inland waters, it's uh, anything between uh, streams, rivers, lakes, wetlands, reservoirs, anything that contains fresh water. And the reason for this um, pathway is that 
these in uh, yeah these inland waters are so tightly connected with the surrounding environment that they would be receiving a lot of carbon. Uh, they can be receiving carbon through direct runoff. So, for instance, you have a, a rainfall event, you will have say some leaf litter or woody debris that will reach rivers. But then you can also get um, uh, an input through the subsurface, through groundwater. And in this case, the carbon species will be a little bit different. They will tend to be dissolved. So dissolve inorganic carbon, dissolve organic carbon. But so at the end of the day, we have all this carbon, all this terrestrial carbon that enters rivers, lakes, uh, and wetlands. Then what happens? Well, the next step is the export, once, once the carbon is in the river. We have two, again, two main pathways of export. And the first one is shown by these uh, vertical red arrows. And this is the emission or degassing pathway at the surface of rivers. So what's, what's happening here is that you have organic carbon in the river that will be decomposed by microbial activity. And, um, and as it's decomposed, it releases either CO2, carbon dioxide, or methane, uh, CH4. And if you add a little bit of turbulence in your river or in your lake, then these gases that are dissolved in the, in the water column will actually be um, getting across the water-air interface and you'll get some leaks. Um, also, you can have this, you can think about a wetland. In wetlands, you don't really have a lot of turbulence. However, you have so much um, methane uh, production in the sediment because you have anoxic conditions that you will also have a very high emission rate. Okay. That's the first pathway. The second pathway, these are the, the, blue, um, the blue arrows. Some of the carbon will actually make its, make its way to estuaries, to um, oceans. And then once in oceans, some of it will settle in the sediment and enter another sink, which we call the ocean sink. But some of it will also get released, um, decomposed, and ultimately released as CO2 sink. And here it's really important that we um, start including these aquatic export pathways of carbon in our carbon budgets, just like what we're doing with fire at the moment. We need to start doing this for uh, rivers and lakes. Because if we don't, it means that the, um, we might be overestimating the, the ability, what we think is the ability of ecosystems to store carbon, the storage potential, in other words. We might be overestimating this. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I should say that in this presentation, I will just talk about um, the emission pathway. All right. So um, there's a lot of evidence. There's more and more evidence, actually, that um, much of these aquatic carbon emissions occur in the tropics. And the reason is quite simple. It's because we have in the tropics, um, we have high temperature all year round. We have high rainfall rates, at least seasonally. And so all this will promote very high um, uh, primary productivity, high vegetation growth. And so you'll have so much carbon that will then uh, be reaching rivers, much more than in temperate areas. And here I'm just going to show you a few um, quotes from some key papers. Basically, in the last decade or so, there's been this, um, I guess, uh, increasingly accepted view that uh, the tropics are a hotspot for carbon emissions. And yeah, this is, these are just a few examples. So in 2013, Raymond and colleagues um, uh, provided the first assessment of carbon dioxide emissions from streams from inland waters, and they wrote that tropical lakes contribute disproportionately, yeah. constituting only 2% of the global lake area, but accounting for 34% of the global lake emission. Uh, more recently, in 2022, Liu and colleagues uh, wrote that across climate regions, tropical rivers are responsible for 57% of the global emission, more than temperate and Arctic regions combined. And one last here, um, the last assessment for methane emissions from rivers and streams, where the author wrote that owing to high CH4 concentrations and extensive riverine area, the tropics account for the largest share of global emissions. So we do have, and there's evidence, we do have reasons to think that in the tropics, there is, a, the, the, I guess, the, the CO2, the greenhouse gas emissions are really, really concentrated in this particular area of the, of the planet. 
But there is a caveat to that. And the, the, the limitation here is that we do not have a lot of observations, a lot of measurements in, um, in the tropics. And historically, this is explained by, you know, uh, the fact that in many developing countries, there's lacking infrastructure, uh, limited funding, sometimes political instability. Um, and so to kind of rectify this, uh, there's been a lot of efforts, recent efforts in, um, in getting observations and measurements in rivers of the tropics. And there's been two main areas of interest. Uh, as you see on this picture, on this map, don't worry too much about the colors, just look at the red points. So here we see a lot of values uh, obtained in the Amazon basin and a lot of values obtained in the Congo basin. These two rivers are what, what they look like, um, very flat areas, lots of rainforest around. And so it makes sense that there's a lot of um, data, uh, new data that have been obtained there because we know that these two basin, these two river basins will contribute a lot to the flux, right? But by getting um, pretty much all our observations from these sort of uh, systems, we might be introducing a bias, an observation bias. We might not be capturing um, the, the diversity, the tropical diversity. And the reason I'm saying this is because the tropics are actually incredibly heterogeneous. Here, I'm just showing you a few pictures to emphasize this point. Um, these are all tropical landscapes that do not really um, look like uh, the, the, the Amazon basin or the Congo basin, but they are also tropics. Uh, so we have the savanna, wetlands. Here we have also mountainous areas. This is an example in Colombia, the Paramo. And this is uh, the highlands in, the, in Papua New Guinea. And I think this view is of the Kimberley. So all this diversity has not been reflected yet in existing data sets. And it is a problem. And if we want to be um, perfectly comprehensive, we also need to add this sort of landscapes. So these are pictures I took recently from um, a trip in Indonesia. I don't know if you can see very well, but um, these are heavily human impacted landscapes. There's a lot of, of waste. Um, there's some cows here on the, in the creek. And so I think that much of the tropics or many of the rivers in the tropics actually look like this. So we do need data in this sort of landscapes as well. Otherwise, we will not be capturing the sort of greenhouse gas emissions that, that are actually um, uh, happening in those, in those systems. All right. And so it is this lack of uh, nuance in the, in the tropical, in existing tropical data that motivated us to get together and do something about it. And so some of us first met in uh, 2021 at a, a conference for, of the Society for Freshwater Science in the US. It was actually COVID times, it was um, online. And so we convened this session and realized that actually in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of work, a lot of studies in the tropics and subtropics, just very local case studies, but that have been adding, adding a lot of data in key ecosystems that haven't been represented uh, in, in bigger data sets because they haven't been compiled in a big data, in a single database. And so we thought we should leverage all these new um, studies and build a database with that, with the objective to refine estimates of the tropical inland water greenhouse gas flux, to explore the drivers, the variations, spatial temporal variations, identify potential hotspots within the tropics, uh, data gaps, etc. That was kind of the idea. And we decided to petition the tropics into five climatic subregions. Um, so I should say that we decided to include the subtropics uh, up to 30, 34 degrees latitude north and south. And the reason for this is that there's already evidence that some of the subtropics are tropicalizing. I don't know if that's the term we can use, but they're becoming the tropics basically because of climate change. We decided to be very um, uh, not conservative in that, in that way. So our five climate regions are the humid tropics, uh, the wet dry tropics, savanna like up here in, the, in northern Australia, the arid and semi-arid tropics, which take up a lot of um, the space, the humid subtropics, much of this in Southeast uh, China, 
in South America and in Southeast United States, and then the highland tropics and subtropics, uh, which are spread across the, the region. All right, so before I get into the results, sorry, it's a very long introduction, but uh, we did uh, just a brief overview of the database. We extracted data from about 500 papers uh, and 15 theses, including theses in Chinese language, thanks to our uh, colleague, Chinese colleagues who were able to translate. And we got to, um, I think, a pretty damn good number of uh, measurements for three different greenhouse gases, CO2, CH4, but also nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, uh, and it can be uh, present in rivers and streams and lakes in very high quantities. So this is what now the, the database looks like, the, the, the spatial um, distribution of points. Uh, the map at the top is for flowing water, so that's streams and rivers. And the map at the bottom is for standing waters. So here I'm talking about lakes, wetlands, ponds, um, reservoirs, anything like that. And so we do get a better, much better coverage, I think, than um, the previous uh, data. Uh, we still have quite a few uh, um, observation gaps in some areas. Um, we have very, very dense data in Southeast China uh, for both uh, flowing and standing waters. Just want to draw your attention uh, to Australia here. You see that there's not that many points yet, but thankfully uh, this is being taken care of by Rexy, Chesky and Yihan, who've been running around taking samples. So very soon we will have a lot of data in, in that part of the world, at least for flowing waters anyway. Um, so that is the data set. Yeah, just showing you quickly the cumulative uh, number of observations. This is an example for CO2 just to show you that for both streams, rivers, and lakes, and reservoirs, we have most of our data that have been um, reported since 2010. So this is really, really recent data uh, for most of it. All right, let's finally jump into the results. Um, so I'll start with flowing waters. So flowing waters, anything from tiny headwater streams to large rivers. Um, for those of you who are not very familiar with the stream order concept. I'll just explain very quickly. Um, so the very tiny uh, streams that start really at the, at the, in the upper parts of a catchment, we call them first order streams. And when two first order streams join, they form a second order stream. And when two second order streams join, they form a third order stream, and so on and so forth. So um, now what I'm going to show you on this uh, figure is the upscaled fluxes per climate region. So we have our five climate regions here, humid tropics, wet dry tropics, arid tropics, the humid subtropics, and the mountain tropics. And um, I will show you some bar plots. And for, so we, have, we will have the results here for CO2, CH4, and N2O. And the, bar, the color of the bar plots are related to stream orders. So if you see um, something uh, reddish, that will be very, very tiny streams, and uh, darker purple is very large rivers. So what do we have for CO2? Well, there's, I guess, two messages here. The first one is that most, the bulk of um, emissions of CO2 from rivers and streams occurs in the humid tropics, and to a lower extent in the wet dry tropics. Um, that's the first message. And then the second message is that small headwater streams really account for most, you see these are just the first order streams here. They account for most of the flux. So most of the degassing occurs in these tiny, tiny little streams, not in the much bigger rivers. Um, okay, so for the other gases, for methane, it's very similar pattern to CO2. And for N2O, we have higher fluxes in the wet dry tropics. So probably some different drivers uh, for this particular gas. So how do we interpret this? Um, well, for the fact that the humid tropics are a bit of a hotspot, uh, this can be explained by the fact that there's so much rainfall year round in the humid tropics, very high temperatures. And so the rivers tend to flow all year round in these, in these areas. And because they are, um, because there's so much flow, there's also a huge surface area. And the, the, the flux depends on the surface area of these rivers. So it makes sense that the humid tropics are actually the hotspot within the tropics. 
And for the fact that the headwaters are so important, much more important in, uh, in degassing greenhouse gases uh, than, than much larger rivers, is linked to several factors. So we have the fact that small headwater streams tend to be in steeper areas. So you have more turbulence. If you have more turbulence, you have more degassing. Then we also have the, the fact that these small streams, they are so numerous, they are everywhere. So in terms of length, they are probably much longer. So you can say, I think first to second order streams, I can't remember the exact number, but it might be 60 or 70% of the length, total length of rivers, of river, uh, river um, network in the world. So it does make sense as well. Um, so we then add it all up and came up with this number, total reflux from tropical rivers every year, about almost 3,000 teragrams of CO2 equivalent. To give you an idea, this is similar to annual emissions from global deforestation and land use change. So it's a pretty huge number. And despite the fact that it's a pretty huge number, it's also 20 to 30 percent, so significantly lower than previous estimates. And we're still working out why this might be, but we think that it could very well be because we've added we've added more data, new data, and particularly data in less productive areas, such as these ones, the arid area, the humid subtropics, the mountain areas, which are so less, so much less productive, hence they produce less uh, greenhouse gases. All right. Um, next step, we, because um, we wanted to get a little bit deeper into understanding the reasons for these variations, we ran uh, random forest models um, to uh, predict riverine concentrations, but also understand what are, what are the main drivers. And so we use predictors, uh, predicting variables, um, to understand the variability in CO2, CH4, and N2. And this is a list of our, um, of our uh, predictors. We have climate predictors, temperature, rainfall, aridity. We also have landscape, what I call landscape predictors. So human footprint, this is an index that tells you uh, the amount of human disturbance, basically, whether it's agricultural, urban. Uh, the slope of the catchment, which as you understood is very important for the degassing. Uh, soil organic carbon that relates to the inputs, wetland extents, uh, and discharge, which is a hydrological um, uh, Variable. And so our results show that, quite interestingly, the, the climate variables, which are in dark purple, they are at least as important in explaining variations as the landscape variables. So we, again, have a, a, a lot of differences and a lot of contrast due to these climate uh, forcings or climate, um, climate zones that we have. Uh, this is not this is true for CO2 and CH4, but not really for N2O. If you see the, the predictive power of the model for N2O is much lower, so it's probably much more complicated. But we do have one uh, predictor that really um, stands out the human footprint. So here we, we clearly have an importance of you know what is on the catchment, what's getting into the river, which does make sense as well. And human footprint is also quite uh, important as a feature for CH4 and CO2. And this really tells us that we really need to get more data into these, these, um, these small streams or big rivers that are heavily impacted by humans. All right, I'll uh, move on to the results for standing water bodies. Uh, I won't go into so much detail for these ones, but I uh, just want to show you an overview of the, of the different, the distribution of fluxes. So here we're going to look at um, the distribution of fluxes per, we've separated the data per um, water body type. So we have lakes, reservoirs, ponds, and wetlands. So in wetlands, there's anything such as floodplains, uh, swamps, like riparian swamps, um, flooded tree, uh, flooded forests, uh, but also uh, paddy, uh, rice paddies. And uh, we also look at the differences across our five uh, climate variables, sorry, climate regions. And so these are the distributions. So very wide ranging distributions for all of them. It's probably quite complicated what's happening in every single uh, of these uh, standing water bodies. But one, oh, sorry. One, um, <laughs> one message here is that the, there are still very clear differences across the different climate uh, 
um, climate regions. So you see that these circles, these climate circles correspond to the median of each of these um, climate regions. And the humid tropics, again, tend to be high. I don't know why it disappeared here, but tends to be higher, um, especially for CO2 and a little bit for CH4, but it's uh, less clear. And the second result that really clearly emerges here is the wetlands. The wetlands have very, very high fluxes and much higher fluxes if you look at the median than uh, ponds, reservoirs, lakes, and uh, the overall uh, values. Even also for, wet, for uh, CH4, where I think we have almost an order of magnitude difference between wetlands and ponds. And so this is really important, this wetland thing, because uh, at the moment, mapping wetlands, riparian wetlands, uh, at uh, regional global scales is really complicated. It's really challenging. We don't really know how to do that. And uh, Bonnie's not, not okay with that. <laughs> we, can, we can have a chat later. But it's the, the fact that they are so seasonally variable, they're so dynamic, it's really hard to capture this in, in um, satellite imagery. But also another issue with wetland mapping is that they tend to overlap, especially for floodplains, they tend to overlap with rivers. So there's the risk of double accounting. You know, you counted already these greenhouse gas emissions for the river, but how about this wetland? So it's, it's still a work in progress. But if anything, our uh, data suggests that this should, be, this should be getting more attention in the, next, uh, in the, in the future. All sure. right. That was becoming interesting. <laughs> um, it's true because I'm now going to actually completely shift gears and um, kind of um, touch on a question that we very often get from people. And people um, very often ask us, okay, it's great that you're measuring all these fluxes in rivers, in lakes, that's awesome. But can we do anything about it? Is there a way uh, through management, whether it's land management, water management, is there a way to decrease these emissions? And the answer is actually yes. In some cases, there might be ways to decrease these emissions. And I'll give you three examples of this, starting with something that's very close to home, uh, the control of feral animals. So you all know the, the impact of feral animals on wetlands. Um, they, they will damage, you know, in terms of water quality, biodiversity, etc. But there's also consequences on the carbon budget of these wetlands. And so the, 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 the main um, damages or the main aspects, impacts, are, there are three, at least, uh, because these animals will be trampling uh, the wetland, there will be a decrease in the carbon storage in the soil. Uh, then, because there will be again, trampling and defecating and all that, there will be potentially increased emissions, you will uh, become, the, the system will become anoxic, and so methane will be produced. So increased emissions. And in case of floodplain, when you're connected to a river, you can increase the export of organic carbon, what I call DOC, POC, so the dissolved or particulate organic carbon. So there probably is a benefit, a carbon benefit in uh, controlling these, these ferals. And there's actually quite a few projects at the moment on this. So the, this project uh, from Nest uh, Marine and Coastal Hub, um, led by both UQ University of Queensland, uh, feral ungulate control to reduce greenhouse gas emission from wetlands. And I know another project that's here at CDU with Lindsay and is it Rachel Broom? Rachel Broom. Rachel Broom. Who are also looking at just that. Very um, good for that. Yeah. And, um, and so, the, the, the idea, hopefully, within a few years, is that once we have more evidence about the actual benefits, the carbon benefits of whether culling or fencing these wetlands to avoid, you know, these, um, these damages by, by ferals, we could potentially start developing um, carbon abatement methodologies uh, where, you know, then we could be tapping into big uh, funds such as the emission reduction fund. So there, there is a lot of potential here that we're still in the stage of needing more data uh, on, on what the actual benefits are. That was for the first example. The second example, completely different, ditch cleaning in Scandinavia, in Sweden in particular. Um, 
So in Sweden, there's a massive um, forestry industry. They have pretty much forest everywhere, and it's um, it's all logged um, very frequently. And they also have ditches because they had to um, drain the land. So they have thousands of kilometers of ditches uh, across the country. And they started, and these ditches are full of sediment, and they emit a lot of greenhouse gases. So some colleagues started to think, to wonder, what would happen if we actually clean those ditches? Could we be um, could we be more carbon neutral? Because the yeah, I should have said that the the goal of the industry is to be actually carbon neutral. So there's there's a lot of um, interest in these sort of um, questions, and uh, there's a few papers, very recent papers, that show that indeed, if you clean the ditch, uh, this one in particular you will have less greenhouse gases in the runoff, hence less emissions. So there is here as well a benefit of managing uh, these ditches. I think I just, after reading this one, I just found this one which actually contradicts uh, the first paper, <laughs> saying that if you clean the ditch, you will get rid of the moss on the ditch, and this moss kind of acts as a trap for, for methane. So jury is still out. We still need more data to, 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 yeah, to inform um, decision, I guess, and to, to get better idea of what's really going on. Um, that was for the second one. And the third one, again, close to home, uh, about riparian vegetation. So riparian vegetation is this very thick and dense uh, strip or corridor of, um, of vegetation ar around along streams and rivers. And these, um, these riparian strips, they are of course, they are a biodiversity refuge. They're very important for ecosystem services, but they also are a massive store of carbon. They are black organic soils. There's a lot of carbon in there. And um, they are also very highly vulnerable to fire. I don't know if you see very well, but this is uh, a riparian zone that doesn't exist anymore because it's been completely burnt. And so there's no data on this. It's pure speculation at this stage. But I'm thinking that the loss of this riparian buffer will um, will have damages on the on the carbon um, on the carbon storage of this. So we will have increased particulate load, especially in those first flushes in November, December, uh, because we don't really have this physical barrier that prevents all the you know the charcoal and stuff to get into the, the stream of the river. But we might also be decreasing the dissolved carbon load because we'll probably have less. Um, microbial activity in the soil because of, of fire. So as you see, there's a lot of things we still don't know, but I think there's potential here as well to all in all to to increase uh, carbon storage by protecting these riparian uh, habitats. And I think Chesky is quite interested in this question, so we might know in the near future a little bit more about this. Um, I think that is it. Yeah, just a few take home messages. Are we good with time, Hannah? Yeah, so good. Awesome. Um, so we saw that the tropics are really diverse, and so scaling fluxes from major river systems such as the Amazon and the Congo is not going to work for the whole region. So we need data from different that, that can actually capture this diversity. When capturing a little bit more of this diversity with all these data, these new data, we found that groundwater fluxes may be lower than previously thought. Um, we still need to get more data in uh, that are poor areas, such as the semi-arid areas with flashy hydrology. It's really hard to be there at the right time because it uh, doesn't last very long. But we do need that. Uh, we need to better integrate floodplain fluxes. And I know there's a lot of work on wetlands at the moment in, in Rio, which is great. Um, and yeah, just mentioning the, the importance of human activities and the fact that land management, in some cases, can help uh, reduce aquatic greenhouse gas emissions, but much more work is needed on this. I think that's it. Thank you. That's great, Glenn. Thank you so much. We still have about 15 minutes left of the session. So if you wanted to open up for questions, we've got plenty of time if there's any questions in the room. Erica. Also with the land management and when you talk about the riparian vegetation, I think that's important also when in the literature that's talking about predicting also with the fluxes, how the emissions might change into the future with climate change predictions. Temperature is a big one that water temperatures will increase while air temperature as well. So I think that riparian veg would also moderate the temperature changes that are happening. Very, very true. Yeah. Especially in those smaller, you know, the first and second. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
So we have a lot of effects, both in terms of biodiversity, but also we know that um, greenhouse gases are much less uh, soluble when the temperature is higher, right? So you will have potentially much higher emissions if you increase the temperature. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you again. That's a fantastic presentation. Anyways, the question is, uh, when you say like inland wetland, they actually capture the carbon. Also that carbon is dissolved when it gets paid by the groundwater. So my question is, is there any ratio, like which are higher, like whether the dissolving carbon or whether the carbon which capture storage? Very good question. Uh, I don't think, I think it would be extremely um, system dependent. So one, one uh, wetland would be completely different mm -hmm. from the other. But it's true that um, it's even, <clears throat> There's not even a clear consensus on the overall, the net effect or uh, carbon effect of wetlands because you know they store a lot as we saw, mm -hmm. but they also emit a lot of methane. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> sometimes there are some wetlands that are actually sources of carbon rather than sinks of carbon. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's quite complicated. So what about in this area, in this tropical savanna? Is there any ratio between yeah, 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 exactly. But if you're interested, we could uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. I always learn lots by hearing from you. So thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is about whether or not you or any of your colleagues have done work on carbon emissions of regulated rivers versus free flowing rivers. And so, in in temperate areas, most of as you know, most rivers are regulated. But in tropical areas. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but it's happening with hydroelectric dams elsewhere up here for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if if it would be possible or if you have looked into whether or not, you know, you know do the regulated river emit more carbon than a free-flowing river? Mm -hmm. I know that yeah, yeah. reservoirs are big <clears throat> methane emitters, but I don't, don't yeah. know what the broader dynamics would be. Yeah, that. I think there's been some work on this and it's definitely not a a good thing to have regulated rivers in terms of free more emissions, do you think? More emissions. Because of these reservoirs, yeah. you know, they usually produce so much methane mm -hmm. because of all the flooded areas, right? Yeah. But also at the at the outlet of the reservoir itself, in general, this is a you have huge emissions both of CO2 and CH4 yeah. because the water outlet is at the at depth and that's where you have the highest uh, methane emissions. Yeah. Um, so you're actually putting very deep water at the surface. So it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. But there's a lot of people working on this, especially right. in Brazil, where there's a lot of reservoirs. Yeah. 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 It's big right if you, you could do yeah. something similar up here. Yeah. 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 On the arrows, maybe when it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I was intrigued with your modeling of age fluxes from the headboard. I think it's here. So you didn't lose productivity or GDP as a new model. I mean, if you're arguing, we are arguing <laughs> and that we're looking at a an aquatic pump with a lot from the terrestrial yeah. system. GPP would sort of subsume temperature, aridity, and rainfall in one variable and give you an indication of what the potential production of the mm. surrounding catchment is. And, you know, you can do that at a global scale that a plunge of the plot wind there. Yeah. I was just interested in this. Yeah. So injecting that into reinforcement. We actually injected it in as a as another potential yeah. predictor, yeah. and surprisingly, the interesting. That would be a good good message to give. That's the true. That's so true. Yeah. You'd assume that we're going to talk around for us. Why is it so yeah. much? Why is yeah. it so much amazing? And I would assume one large reason is it's it's pushing out so much product production. For sure. Creating so much yeah. biomass. There's so much leach change. Yeah, yeah. Through the quick flow pathway to the river, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Seeing that in the dark, but mm -hmm. it's fascinating. We've not seen all these other variables. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So then there's the question of this the GPP product I use, mm -hmm. maybe the the spatial resolution was not good enough, or yeah, I could. But that core scale that you where you've carved up the planet with the tropics into those five boxes, there'd, there'd be such dramatic difference. Sure. You could be across those. So yeah. You know, arid zones, but high, low temperature montane yeah. systems would be dramatically lower. And in, to be honest, there's some pretty bloody good estimates that we've lost that race. Mm. What the GDP of the Amazon and the Amazon is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's some
Maybe I should revisit this model before. We won't publish this thing where you've got your target. Yeah, yeah. And we can do that with some confidence in the semi arid mm -hmm. in the savannah. Of course, yeah. we can do that if you want to. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. This is a question from Karen online. She's wondering is there any evidence that cyanobacterial blooms associated with nutrient inputs add to emissions? And if so, could that be a further incentive for management? Um, I know of um, some work in China where they showed that um, the fact that they were only looking at CO2, so that actually is very similar to what we were talking about with Keller. Um, the fact that there's been a lot of impoundments or reservoirs, new reservoirs in China, uh, has resulted in a decrease, a very sharp decrease in CO2 emissions, and that's totally related to eutrophication. So you have a lot of uptake within the water column of the CO2. But the point is that they did not look at CH4, and if they had, I think there would have been a huge increase in CH4. I don't know if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. but, uh, last, uh, last month I was in the US in a conference, and in Canada they have a lot of reservoirs, but there is different climate. And they mentioned yes, the CO2 decrease with the time of the reservoir, but the methane is very random. Yeah, know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that it doesn't show an increase of methane. Yeah, but it's very random. Yeah. You know the complexity of methane here in rivers. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're always trying to simplify things, but it's not so. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Um, you asked for hard questions. So ah, in the yeah. beginning, you showed all of these maps, and you yeah. said, oh, we've added a lot, we've improved. I'm sure there's still some error in, or some uncertainty in these flux estimates. Yeah. Um, and as someone who's been the victim of your desire to get more data, <laughs> I'm wondering <laughs> what amount of data do we need, or how much more data do we have to collect before we can have a certain amount of before we feel that we've got a grasp on this topic. Mm. Like, when can we say, this is enough? We know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Is that in the horizon, or are we just how likely? We need one with Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. good one. There's no simple answer for this one. Yeah. But uh, I think we should at least try to focus on areas where there's very little data, like the semi-arid tropics. We've done a little bit of that uh, around Tenant Creek. And, but, I mean, these catchments, these systems are so flashy that it's really hard to be there at the right time. Having said that, these extreme events might actually be, we, we did a little bit of work on the Howard River and we showed that within one single monsoon event, 40% of the annual emissions occurred. Sorry, yeah, they occurred within this one. So if you miss these big uh, flashy events, you might actually miss a big part of your class. So it's not just spatially, it's also temporal that we really need to move out. And since you are sorry, <laughs> since you are talking about similarity uh, rivers, uh, how can you address the issue of the seasonality of the rivers? Some of them they are intermittent, you know. Yeah. So, and you already you gave us some calculations. So did you address this in your calculation? Yeah, we do. We do include the fact that uh, so we we use some sort of flow intermittency index in our calculations. So it is. We know that in the arid tropics, there's a lot of potential rivers, but they're almost always dry, right? Yeah. So we do take this into account. Yeah, but as you say, the hot moments also, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the hot moments, like if you don't catch the, your sampling during the first event, yeah. you're missing a huge amount of flux, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. But like in any global yeah. uh, scale analysis, it's yeah, huge uncertainty. So, yeah, Jenny. Oh, thank you. That's just wonderful hearing what you've been doing. But I was just thinking about um, getting further into the, you know, arid tropics and the fact there was a huge rain event down the down around the castle of waters, so Elliot, you know, getting towards Tennant Creek, and they reported a big fish kill. Yeah. And that usually occurs because you've got all that organic matter is mm -hmm. suddenly being mobilised and you've got bacterial yeah. activity. So I was wondering whether you've got studies where but, you know, you can only capture it in, as you say, it's really hard mm. to capture. You can capture the flooding with satellite imagery, yeah. but if you combine that with experiments where you flooded, you know, cores, yeah. are people doing that so that you've got experimental data mm. that's very small scale, but could be exactly what's happening at that soil water interface? Yeah. 
there's very few uh, studies working on this, what we call the particulates organic matter or organic carbon. There's very, very few, but I know of some people starting to use satellite imagery to actually look at this. Uh, it's just, it's still in, in its infancy, but it's, I think it's the future because to, to capture this sort of events in very remote areas, we will never be able to be there. Right. And actual numbers you could use for carbon by just doing cores of flooding cores of yeah, yeah, yeah. from that landscape. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. different amounts of leafing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of it. There's a lot of core experiments have been done in the past, more to answer questions about nutrient yeah. release into the water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm. Is it possible, sorry to interrupt, if it is a lighter drone and it is possible to go there for like a smaller scale, lighter drone would be like a drone instead of getting carbon, you can get the elevation. Yeah, the I think you could get what's feasible with the drone, so organic carbon, but when it comes to dissolved inorganic carbon and the gases, I can't see them. That's the main problem. Yeah, new Greg's here. I think he's trying to. It's no getting away from that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, I'm assuming that it's probably too fine scale to use remote sensing. Okay. To sorry, remote sensing to detect the emissions in the streets. I think they're also starting to do that, but yeah, you would need a, a huge. The problem is that some some areas, not really the savannas, but some. Uh, wetter uh, territorial ecosystems will produce methane as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think you've been able to isolate what's um, uh, fossil fuel methane from like natural methane yeah. now with remote sensing. So you yeah, can right. Wow. Have, like, separate those two. Yeah. And I was just wondering with the correlation with CO2 emissions with methane emissions, like it seemed to correlate well right, in most places. Um, mm -hmm. If you could detect methane, could yeah, you perhaps make an assumption about the yeah. Methane. In general, we find that methane is much harder to model, and surprisingly, the results yes. were quite good here. But in general, it's it's, it's very much driven by local processes. When yes. CO two is a little bit easier to 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 simulate, but yeah, potentially maybe. Right, I think. Yeah, I'm just curious, when you showed the spatial distribution of the studies, I think from 1973 to last year, yeah. and I was just looking at Africa, and you see a lot of studies there, right? Yeah. Now, I was just wondering, 1973, what methodology were they using? Because collecting that is really a big challenge even at the moment. Yeah. So I'm just curious um, to know the kind of methods they're using to... Yeah, um, pretty much the same methods are what we're using now. Did you? Yeah, did you like gas it? chromatography. So sampling, um, like keeping a sample of the of the gas. Yeah. So just headspace method to equilibrate, and then you you analyze your sample on the gas chromatography. It's really quite basic, actually. But they were not doing now. What we tend to do, so we do more isotope uh, measurements. Whereas at the time they were just doing the concentrations. Yeah. Oh yeah, the covariance are right. Yeah, they are trying to build a network, right? Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is um, with the feral animals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I see that I feel like I don't know. I think it's just a overhype yeah. because um, they, they, well, now people doing studies on it. But even if we focus on only feral animals, mm -hmm. I think size will matter, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the size of this animal, mm -hmm. in terms of particularly when they see um, the methane emission in the land areas. So I think it's, it's one of the things that will be good if we look at, you know, size, you know, and the rate of emissions. Yeah. From Do you think it would be about the density of animals as well? Yeah. Not but, just the size? Yeah, density would also be a good thing to look. But obviously, if you are looking at angulate with this, you know, massive and they are yeah, yeah, yeah. on there for sure. But, it, it, you know, that is a big, you know, emission yeah. that, you know, yeah. Yeah. That would probably be different between a yeah. buffalo and a pig. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and when that happens, I mean, when you have some resources like that, it's really help with allocation of resources in terms of managing mm. and this product. You know where to put more animal because mm -hmm. you know that with this one, emission is there, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Not significant. Yeah, that's true for culling, although if you do fencing, it doesn't really matter what the, what the animals are, right? Because yeah. you would be 
uh, excluding both them or any. What sort of fencing might work in it? Yeah. Yeah. Buffalo is a very interesting place to Yeah, we just got to finish it. Sure. Because if you find a buffalo, you won't be able to and buffalo until you get pigs through on that. They've been fencing wetlands in Queensland. Yes. That's quite sort of an experimental thing at the moment, but it's shown promise. It's expensive to do yeah. and, and difficult to maintain. Yeah, and it's a long term thing. Yeah. Long term, and then, then wet season is what they were trying to mention it because the massive wet season is the two last years, and then that's two undergrounds worth of fencing. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do the economics, yeah. um, there's a whole seminar. Oh. Mm. Mm. Maybe you can prove that you save carbon. That's the whole point where the emission offset funds defense, mm -hmm. right? And it was community managed the whole thing, yeah, yeah. That's what else. Thanks so much. Thank Any other questions? Maybe one, two, last question. Anybody has any more? No, in that case, thank you again. Yeah, big thanks to Clem. Thank you also all for attending here in person and online. Um, thanks to the Northern Institute as well, who always kindly let us use the topic. Um, please keep an eye on our seminars page for our upcoming topics. In two weeks from now, we'll hear from Sunil and two weeks after that from Lindsay. So we hope you'll all be able to come along to those sessions too. Um, and for everyone who's here, please head over to Yellow 2 for um, the Real Money Tea, which starts at 10.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.